Hello and welcome to session three. We're going to take a look at Windows Server 2012 planning and installation. I think we've already heard that uh, word plan before uh, during uh, the last couple of sessions. Still extremely important, obviously, for uh, getting things at least reasonably right when you do the uh, when you do an implementation. Uh, quite often, though, I found that the, the planning process is kind of skipped over a little bit. Now, this uh, this portion here we're going to be taking a look at is concentrating more on the file system. So if you already have a lot of background on the NTFS shares and NTFS permissions rather and share permissions and so on, then some of this is probably going to be a review for you. Uh, you may already do, be a complete expert at it and that's awesome. The way that Server 2012 has changed things isn't fundamentally di uh, different. However, they've changed a little bit of the terminology kind of important on exams, of course, uh, and reading documentation and so on. And the second thing they've also done is they've created some newer tools that can be used now for granting permissions and checking permissions, etc. You can always go back to the old standby of using uh, Windows Explorer to grant share permissions, uh, NTFS permissions, and so on. But you can also utilize some of these newer tools that uh, that are av available with Server 2012. So we're going to go back and forth between the different tools. Uh, to me, whatever is easiest for you, that's kind of the key thing to go with. Uh, if you're comfortable with using Windows Explorer because you've been using it since the NT days, great. Uh, if you want to take a look at uh, how the Windows Server 2012 is because maybe it's a little bit quicker or easy to understand, great. It's, uh, it's really up to you. And if you want to go on to the PowerShell, Fantastic. I mean, the, the PowerShell is an absolutely wonderful tool to be, uh, to be uh, getting involved with because you do have to use it in SQL Server. You do have to use an Exchange Server uh, 2007, 2010, 2013, and so on. And of course, if you're using a Server Core, well, there you go. So let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to take a look at configuring file and share access. Now, my assumption is that if you're putting in a server, you have something to share. Otherwise, why would you put one in? You may be sharing files, folders. You may be sharing some other resources. Perhaps it's a printer type, sharing a, a, a printer shared environment. Maybe you're taking a look at sharing databases, SQL Server, for example. What we're going to concentrate here on, though, is looking at file shares and, uh, and our uh, file system uh, access, both locally, but more importantly, across the network connection. Because, of course, we're playing with Server 2012, and most users are not going to be accessing a server from the direct, uh, directly from the console. At least I'm hoping not. When you sit down and you take a look at these things, and you, I usually start off with a, hopefully a reasonably blank piece of paper, or better yet, a, a whiteboard or a smart board where I can start drawing things. Keep a pencil, keep an eraser handy, and now we start going through, well, what do I want to share? What's your objective? Now, of course, hopefully you're not going to be doing this in isolation. You're going to be working with the business in order to figure out what their goals are. And, of course, one of the annoying things is that they quite often say, well, I want it done this way. Well, they may or may not be up to date on how to do things a little bit more efficiently. And that's where you, as the expert, are going to be coming into play. And part of that, of course, is the, plan, uh, the, the, the actual planning process. So you're going to talk with the business, figure out what exactly it is that they're trying to share, who's supposed to have access to it, are there specific names, are there naming conventions that you have to follow. If there aren't naming conventions, maybe it's a greenfield installation, maybe you want to come up with a naming convention of how to uh, designate shares and so on. You'll have to take a look at groups. Groups, creating groups, universal groups, global groups, local groups, uh, is all a whole section all by itself. How to set up that hierarchy of when to use global groups and universal groups and local groups to grant access to our different file, share, uh, file and share access is also a separate topic. So a lot of these things kind of build on each other. So we're, uh, again, going to take a look at just the file side of things, file and, uh, the file and uh, folder type of uh, sharing of resources, just as establishing a base. Now, on the last uh, item here on the, on the slide, you can take a look at offline file settings. If you have traveling users, and I think a lot of us do have a number of traveling users, you may want to make offline file shares available. So if you're taking a look at 
the uh, your traveling users and what they need access to, they may see things such as, or they may, you, know, you may want to consider things such as, what do they have to have access to while on the road? What things do they not need access to? Obviously, they can't really cache the entire file server of, you know, 8, 10 terabytes of data. Well, most likely not anyway. So you're going to have to kind of pick and choose what they have access to. Uh, I'm sorry, to answer a question, Andrew, is uh, you can only see a window. Uh, is there a chat window? There should be a chat window, yeah. Uh, if you collapse your questions window, you may see a chat window right below it. Uh, you may have to expand it and scroll down a little bit, but I think there's supposed to be a chat window in there. If not, again, the question window I'm I have open right now, so I'll try to keep, a, keep an eye on that. From the Server 2012 side, I think you've already had some of this on the, one of the previous sessions as, uh, as well, too. We do support a couple of different protocols. The SMB protocol has been the standard file sharing protocol for quite, quite some time. They've changed it a little bit, you know, as far as what some of the capabilities are, but it's still overall used by, uh, by, um, uh, with our Server 2012 uh, server uh, installations. Another option though is you could look at NFS. Probably want to take a look at this if you have to support Unix and Linux type of systems accessing your server 2012 uh, file system. There's always other ways to do this as well too, but these are, these are a couple of uh, items just out of the box which, uh, which you can take a look at. Well, let's take a look at configuring file and share access. As opposed to Windows NT and Server 2000, Server 2003, and so on, uh, we have a kind of a, a new option. I shouldn't say a new option, but we do have an option that we can take a look at. It's called Access Base Enumeration. In some versions, you would uh, a user could log in to the network via the network and be able to see different subdirectories and if they double clicked on them they wouldn't get access to them well the kind of question well the question kind of kind of arises is well wait a minute if i don't have access to that directory and that folder system why do i see it well one of the things that you could take a look at and consider is utilizing access base enumeration so if a user doesn't have access to it, whether it's a file or whether it's a folder, etc., they don't have any type of permissions for it, then they don't see it. I kind of like this idea because when users start seeing stuff and say, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, you know I, I see these areas, well, why can't I have access to them? Well, there may be some very good business reasons why certain users or why certain groups don't have access to them. It could be HR, uh, the HR area. It could be a finance area. It could be a, a production or a research and development areas. So again, this is a, one of those planning, piece, uh, planning pieces that we have to consider as well. As we mentioned just a few moments ago, we also may want to consider the allowing cache, uh, allow caching of shared files. So again, if we have users, which may not always be in the office, they may have a laptop or, or some other uh, system, maybe one of the cool uh, Windows Surface tablets, running around out doing sales or uh, marketing, etc. Maybe they need to have access to these offline files or files that are that are located on the server, and they, you need to have them as uh, on the road, and you don't have access all the time to the uh, to the server environment. Well, this is, again, one of those special areas, perhaps, of just a, a small, hopefully a reasonably small collection of, uh, of files that people might need access to. The reason I say it's, it should be a fairly small area is because quite often people don't have terabytes upon terabytes of data uh, available, or storage space available on their laptops or their, or their tablets and so on. So you want to kind of keep it a little bit uh, within reason. Plus, syn uh, synchronization of these things can also be a little bit uh, time-consuming. Branch cache is very cool. Uh, you can enable the branch cache on the file shares if you wish to. This is an interesting technology because we cover this quite a bit more in later sessions, but really what it is that if you have a branch office 
and that branch office doesn't have ac direct access to the local server for certain files, perhaps the files are located on a server at the main office, once one of the entities, it could be via the server, it could be via a Windows 7 uh, workstation, etc., accesses a file at the uh, home office or the main office, then that file can be cached locally in what's referred to as branch cache at the branch location, the branch office location. And so now if any of the other computers or any of the other users, I should say, needs to access that file, they'd be able to access it locally rather than having to cross the WAN link. So it's really trying to save bandwidth on, on the WAN. Now in some locations, some parts of the world, you don't have to really worry about uh, uh, WAN uh, availability. There's just heaps and heaps and heaps of it. But, you know, I, I think we've all been in environments where our WAN environment is very, very limited. It could be just a couple of megabits if we're lucky. And in some, in some cases, uh, we may be out in remote sites where uh, we're lucky to get uh, 500K uh, going, through, uh, going through to a location. So some neat technologies here that are available, again, that we'll, t we'll, we'll take a look at uh, future sessions. Another interesting one here is encrypting data access. I'm not going to go too much into this one, uh, but it does pretty much exactly what it says. So if you have, uh, if you're trying to access a, uh, a, a file remotely, then it can be set up for encryption. There's obviously some background uh, things that we have to set up uh, as well, too, in order to get the data encrypted, um, protocol selection, and so on. All right, well, let's just go ahead and take a, a look at uh, actually creating a file share and, a, and uh, assigning permissions. Now, this should be, if you've been working with Windows Server for a while, this will probably be a bit of a, uh, uh, bit of a review. But for those of us that may not have been playing with the servers uh, very much, then perhaps this will be a, a bit new. All right, I am going to use Windows Explorer for this portion. And in this case, I guess I should go ahead and show you a little bit about what's, uh, what the setup is here for, uh, for this test environment or this demonstration environment. All right, there's a couple of ways to do this, but uh, I'll sh this is probably more familiar to a lot of you. I've created a couple of users. I've got Mary, Sally, Ted, and Tom. So just four users here. I have a couple of groups that I've created. I've got a finance group, of which Sally and Tom are members. I've got a sales group, of which Mary and Ted are members. Probably won't play too much with the sales group. What I'm really worried about, uh, where I really want to work with, is the, uh, the sales group and some individual users. This, again, this isn't what I would do in a production environment, but it is, uh, it, it's sufficient for, uh, for demonstration purposes. So I've got Sally and Tom here in finance. So I want to create a new folder. And this new folder is going to be called Office Share because I want to share some things within the office. Now I already have a finance folder, production sales users, etc. None of these, by the way, has any permissions assigned to them. Uh, I just created the uh, directory structure. I haven't done anything with it. I'll right click on Office Share, come on down here to Properties, and I have a couple of tabs that I'm really uh, interested in. The first one is the Share tab. The second one is the Security tab. These are the two tabs we're going to be playing with quite a bit here. I have a couple of options here. I can create a click on this Share or what's referred to as Advanced Sharing. For those people who may be familiar with older versions of Windows, this is a bit of a change here. So I'm going to click, I'm going to click on uh, just Share at this point. And since I want everyone to have access to this office share, it may have things such as schedules for people out of the office and maybe have, have some PDF files for, uh, uh, for different types of things or just an area to pass things back and forth. One option is to give everyone access. I could also use authenticated users as well too. And I'm going to give everyone read write access to this share. So they can contribute as well as uh, just to read the information that's out there. So select read write, and I click on share, and I'm done. That's all there is to it using this type of, uh, of interface. 
And that's all there is. Again, it's probably pretty familiar with, uh, uh, for most people. Now, what I want to do, though, since I use that method of sharing, going through this little, uh, this little button here, let's take a look at the advanced sharing. Well, it does have share this folder selected. I do have the office share as the name, which is consistent with what I put in the previously. Let's check my permissions. Well, when I created it, everyone got full control, change, and read checked. Now, those three share permissions haven't changed across, I don't know how many versions of, uh, of Windows now. Um, so there's no real, real changes there. By default, of course, administrators get uh, a full control for the share uh, as well. Now, if I wanted to, I can get a little bit more uh, specific as far as exactly what. Maybe I want to take off some of the shares, uh, some of the permissions. Maybe I just want to go with read permissions as an example for the share. Maybe I just want to go with change, full, etc. We'll leave it where it was. I'll cancel out of this. I just want to double check to see what was actually given. All right, so there's my share permissions established for the office share. Real simple, real easy. Now, let, we'll come back to this uh, in a little bit. Meanwhile, I'd like to come back to some other things that we want to discuss, and that's configuring file and share access. Now, we created the share, and that's great. The issue now is when is that share or when do those share permissions actually kick in? Well, the share permissions kick in when you actually try to access the files and folders over a network connection. If you're logging in locally to the server, then share permissions don't have any effect. So if I log in as a local user, if, if somehow I manage to get login local uh, rights into a server, I would see that none of the share permissions that were assigned to me would actually take effect. Now, from a practical point of view, of course, I'm hoping that only administrators have access to your servers, in the ideal world at least, and it's kept in a locked room, etc. But in theory, this is how what, uh, what, could, what could happen. Well, the other thing we have to take a look at, though, are NTFS permissions. The NTFS uh, permissions are combined with our file permissions. And I'm sorry, I need to take a look at uh, some uh, of our questions here. Ah, evidently there's some people with microphones that are open. All right, let me try doing this. All right, now has that taken care of the background noise that you guys might have had? Okay, I'm hoping that took care of the background noise. Um, yep, it did. All right. And I assume that everybody can still hear me, so I didn't mute myself. That's always good news. Uh, there's some background noise in TV, radio. Yep, uh, website. Um, I'm hoping that just got take care of th taken care of. Thank you, George. Um, everything virtualized, even access to the server doesn't help. Yeah, you're right on that one. All right, so now, when we're taking a look at these uh, NTFS permissions, in combination with share permissions, we can have a bit of a, a challenge, I suppose. Um, especially if you're not confident or if the planning process wasn't carried out, or maybe you're walking into a, a new location where things have just been put together, there's no documentation, which is always a lot of fun when people don't write things down of what they did, and you're trying to figure out, well, what, what, what's going on? What do they do? Well, let's get take a look at an idea of what these NTFS permissions are for in the first place. We want to have these NTFS permissions to control, at a more granular level, access to our files and folders. Now, what I mean by granular is that just because I share them across the network, I only had three options, read, change, and full control. Well, that ain't real great if I'm trying to keep people from uh, perhaps executing files, or maybe I want them to execute files but not be able to, or and open files, but I don't want them to uh, to be able to uh, 
and I want them to be able to change the contents, but I don't want them to be I don't want them to be able to delete the uh, the file itself. So we can we can work with NTFS permissions to get very very granular. In fact, there's about 14 of these uh, of special permissions that we could uh, we could actually look at. Now the cool thing about the NTFS permissions is that regardless of whether or not you log in locally or you're accessing the information across the network, it doesn't matter. They still take effect. In order to access a file, in summary, in order to access a file, a user does have to have the appropriate NTFS permissions. The planning process that comes into play here, though, is that you don't want to grant them too many or too high a level of permissions. You want to grant the amount of permissions they require in order to do their work. Now, I've been harping upon the word permissions. Some people, there is uh, confuse the word with the word rights. So if you have a rights to a file, for example. Well, Microsoft is, has defined, oh, gosh, I've got to be careful about how I say that one. In the Microsoft vernacular, you will see that permissions typically are accessing files and folders. Rights may be something such as changing the system time on a local PC. So it You've got to be kind of careful on, on how you're phrasing some of your questions or, or how you're do, doing some of your documentation, whether or not you use the words permissions or rights. Uh, again, we can go into that a little bit more uh, in detail in later sessions when we're actually working with uh, ac uh, ac accessing uh, uh, the workstations or setting, uh, setting up server environments and so on. All right, a couple things. Uh, always been, is there any way to stop a file from being copied from the server share to a local workstation? Um, yes, but not via, uh, via NTFS uh, permissions and share permissions. You may want to take a look at FSRM File Server Resource Manager, and you can also tag the files so that they can't be printed, for example. You can, take a, uh, you can tag the files so they can't be emailed. You can be pretty granular as far as how you can, how, what, these, uh, uh, what you can do with some of these, uh, how, the, how these field files are actually going to be utilized. Background noise every 10 seconds with a pop-up screen saying this is not allowed. Okay. Um, is anybody else getting that pop-up by any chance? All good. Audio all good to hear. Oh, gosh, Pedro, I'm so sorry. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks gentlemen. Appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the fun part. Now, if you really want to confuse people, like your bosses or, or uh, people who are not real technical in there, start throwing TLAs or three-letter acronyms at them, and just to, uh, and, you know, makes makes at least uh, sound like you know what you're doing. Ideally, however, you really do know what you're doing, and you won't use these three-letter letter acronyms. You'll actually break it down into an area where, when you're working with uh, within the business environment, you're working with these people who are trying to get their their systems set up. You'll try to stay away from some of these, uh, these, uh, these acronyms and so on. But you do need to understand what they're for and what, they're, uh, what the concepts are. So let's kind of walk through this and maybe walk through uh, some, uh, some analogies that you could use in a business environment as an example. Permissions are stored in an access control list, an ACL. Great. So what this conceptually what I think of is I have a piece of paper and I have permissions and people and resources and all sorts of things kind of thrown onto this piece of paper, but it's got to be a little bit better organized here. So I end up with something that's referred to as an ACE or an access control entry. Each access control entry has security principles. Well, that's just a fancy name for a user. So I have a user or more probably ideally a group of users. It could be in the form of, let's say, a global group. And this global group is my security principle, and I'm going to add it to an access control list, which is going to, have, again, have the individual permissions, which contain the access control entries, for accessing a resource. So the way I look at it now is I have a piece of paper, and it's my security roster. 
I have my names of my people or names of the groups. And off to the next column, I have, okay, well, what resource are they supposed to have access to? And I have what level of access do they have? Do they have read permissions? Do they have full control? Do they have the read write permissions? So it's essentially just a sheet of paper, at least I can say conceptually a sheet of paper, where I have a user with a certain set of permissions to a certain resource. That's all it really is. But in all the documentation and in taking a look at uh, uh, what you may be having to write up and explain to users, you need to kind of keep in mind what, uh, um, what the more technical details are. So let's take a look at some things that you might need to be aware of if you're going to be going for your exams in Server 2012 or reading some more up-to-date documentation. Now, basic permissions were known as standard permissions in previous versions. And you had advanced permissions used to be known as special permissions. Not a big deal. When you see it on the screen, it's pretty obvious. But when you don't have a screen in front of you, you're writing an exam of some sort, then this may not be all that, uh, all that uh, obvious. So just kind of a side note there. So we have 14 advanced permissions, as I mentioned previously. And NTFS has the six basic permissions. Let's take a look at that. It's a lot easier to actually see how we're working with this. Now I'm going to open up the Office Share, which we created previously. We've already covered the sharing. Let's take a look at security. Now in security, I have my six big permissions. Full control, modify, read and execute, list folder, read and write. I hope that's six. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it is six. Good. Read is pretty obvious. I get to read the contents of a file, for example. List folder contents, at least I can see what's in that file or folder, see what the names are, things like that. I may not be able to whole, do a whole lot with it, but hey, at least I can see it. Yippee. Read and execute is pretty handy, especially if I have some sort of executable file that I need to have access to. That will at least allow me to get through it. Write permissions, really handy for uh, documents if you want to be able to write to the document. Modify is pretty much everything, obviously everything below here, uh, as well as uh, being able to uh, delete uh, contents and so on. And finally, full control. The big one here that I think of is being able to change owners or take ownership of uh, the file, set permissions, and so on. Well, let's take a look at seeing the advanced permissions here. Uh, let's see, let's take a look at everyone, and we'll do edit. Oh, gosh, there's just the basic ones. Well, if we come over to the right-hand side, hidden over here, we have our advanced permissions. And, yes, there's quite a few more. Read attributes, read extended attributes, create files, create folders, write, write extended, delete, delete subfolders, all sorts of combinations. Probably don't have to worry too much about this, especially if you're just setting up a server or if you're having to maintain a, a server. Um, the six basic permissions are probably enough. However, if you do have to get more granular, you do have to watch out. Maybe it's for some uh, critical applications or some critical uh, file access. Maybe it's an R&D area, HR area. You may need to take it, uh, tweak these just a little bit. The other thing you can also play with is, what does it apply to? Is it just going to be the existing folder? The default is, of course, that folder, the current folder, and everything below it to include all the files and subfolders. In other words, what you set here is going to be inherited all the way down through the structure. Files only, subfolders only, subfolders and files only, so on. So you do have a, a few different types of selections there that you can make. All right, so that's what we're looking at with the basic permissions, as you see here, as well as here, and the advanced permissions. Again, planning is really, really critical for this portion because otherwise, hey, you're never, you're never going to know what uh, um, 
what's going to be going on. Now, the other thing that, I, that does get to be a challenge, at least from my perspective, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is you're walking into a new job. They said, here, these are your servers and you're in charge. Great. Well, where's the documentation specifying what permissions are given to what folders and what groups? Uh, chances are, uh, yeah, chances are you may not have any documentation. Or if it is documented, it may not be complete. Windows permissions architecture, as far as allowing and denying permissions. Well, we have two different two different types or two different ways we can uh, really affect this through the access control entries. You can either allow people to have access, or you can deny them access. Well, that's pretty simple. The first way is additive. Don't give anybody any permissions to anything at all. Deny by default. That's my favorite rule. Don't give anybody access to anything. If they need it, well, they'll come and ask. Well, it's one, op one way to approach it anyway. As people need access, then you go ahead and add them to security groups, global groups and so on, local groups, whatever, uh, which, whichever model that you're, you're having to implement at that time. Additive is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, another one option, though, is subtractive. So in other words, you grant everybody all permissions to everything. And then start denying them access to that, those areas which they shouldn't be accessing. So I guess the question would be, which way do you guys do it? Do you go additive, don't give them any permissions, and then just add them as they need it? Or do they go ahead and just do subtractive and just give everybody all the permissions and you know that they're not going to hurt themselves or you because you've given them all the permissions? Yeah, I think most of us are probably doing additive. But again, it kind of depends upon what structure. And in some cases, here's the fun part. In some cases, you may have to also use subtractive in con conjunction with additive. As an example, you've got your documentation. You've planned out your file system. You've looked at inheritance. You've got everything from the business on how they want things structured. You agree to it. They agree to it. Life is really good at this point in time. And so you start building this, the, uh, the folder structure. And then, of course, like so many other things, things change. They say, well, wait a minute. Really, these, this area here has to be different than everything else. And yes, we want everybody to have access to it, except for all of these people here shouldn't have access to it. Well, now you've just kind of trashed inheritance to a certain extent. Now you're going to have to maybe block inheritance. This is one way to do it, at least, by putting in the um, deny attribute, which overrides anything else as far as being allowed access to it, uh, in order to meet their business goals. Uh, is there any tool to allow creation of report of service shares and permissions, i.e. self-document? Great question. Yes, there is, mostly third party, unless you want to slog through it uh, using uh, Windows Explorer or something like that. Uh, I'm not aware of anything out of the box that Microsoft has. Although I haven't looked at, um, oh, what is it, uh, not SysTools. Um, they had some really good tools long, long ago on the Microsoft site for doing things like this. Sys, not sysinternals. I'm sorry. Sysinternals. Thank you, Andrew. Sysinternals. Uh, a, Power, a PowerShell would probably do something like that, yeah. Uh, probably not the command line, but the PowerShell, uh, Peter, I think would be a good option. Now, what those switches are, etc. I don't know. I like prettier reports, quote, end of quote. Uh, and uh, I, I know there's some good third-party ones that will do that. Sysinternals is worth a shot, although I don't think they've updated that site for uh, years uh, from the looks of it. Still some good stuff. If you haven't, haven't hit sysinternals.com, uh, as Andrew has, a, has, has the uh, spelling there for you, uh, you might give it a shot. Again, part of the planning process we mentioned before is inheriting permissions. Permissions do, it, it's like taking a bucket of water and then tipping it over the roof of your house. It just runs downhill. And that's how permissions are. Whatever you dump down from the top extends all the way down through the bottom unless 
you change the permissions, you deny permissions, or you block inheritance. So there are a couple of ways to stop inheriting uh, permissions all the way through the through the S hierarchy. So if I had, as an example, oops, hang on, let me bring up my uh, server interface here. There we are. So if I had finance, and within finance, let's uh, create a couple of um, subdirectories. Um, how about AP for um, accounts payable? And of course, if we're going to have an accounts payable, we of course have to have an accounts receivable. So I can grant permissions here on my finance. And um, let's see. Oh, sorry, advanced sharing, share that folder, permissions. Um, there we are. So finance is now being shared out as finance. Oops, sorry. Um, oh, it's not quite what I wanted here, but um, if I assign it here at the finance side of things, the fact that I have it shared out with everyone at full permissions dribbles down to accounts payable and accounts receivable. It's better if I start assigning some uh, uh, NTFS permissions as well to see that, and we'll see that here in a little bit. But uh, that's just a quick and dirty way that you could actually uh, um, take a look at the uh, inheritance side of things. Okay, I don't want to share that anymore because I'm going to be using that a little bit later on as a demo. So as I mentioned before, we can turn off inheritance. We're going to have a demo of this as well too. Or we can also deny permissions. The interesting thing here is that if you give a person full permissions to, let's say, a file share, for example, and they get full permissions directly, through their, uh, through their user account, not the best way to do it, but you could do it that way, as well as maybe through a couple of group accounts, they also get full control. But if they belong to a group which has been, which has been given deny, that deny will override all of the full uh, controls that were given to them. In other words, the deny is higher up on the access control list than any of his full control. So it encounters that uh, access denied first. So. Again, top of the list. So something kind of consider when you're looking at denying permissions. I try to stay away from those whenever possible. I try to, to uh, make sure that the uh, file folder structure uh, is um, conducive to inheritance where I don't have to do those kind of things. Here comes the fun part. As we kind of scratch our head and wonder, well, gee, why does Tom or Mary or one of my other users here have access to something or don't have access to something? And I know I gave it to them. Well, where do they get their permissions from? We have to calculate what the effective access is at this point. And that's going to be a combination of our allow and our deny permissions. It's going to be via our inheritance, as we just previously discussed. It's going to be member group membership, whether it's a local groups, global groups, universal groups any kind of explicit assignment directly to that user. So I can get permissions from lots of different areas, and that gets to be a bit of a challenge as well. Uh, and there are some, uh, uh, some tool, built-in tools that you can utilize for, uh, uh, for figuring out what some of these permissions are. And we talk about those in some other sessions. Whole idea here is our allow, uh, our allow permissions are cumulative, so we get to add them all up. So if I get full, if I, excuse me, if I get read and write permissions from one place, I get uh, modified from another one, I add them all together, and I end up with the least restrictive. That is, I get modify plus everything else, in other words. Deny permissions, as I mentioned before, override all allow permissions, period, and dot. And of course, if I explicitly assign permissions to, to someone or some up some, uh, a security principle, then that does take precedence over anything that they may have inherited. So now we have to combine your NTFS permissions and kind of note this because we're going to go walk through a demo which gets to be a bit, uh, uh, a bit of a challenge in figuring out where some of these things are. We have to combine our NTFS permissions and combine our share permissions. Now remember our NTFS permissions are additive. 
So if I got read permissions from one place, I got write permissions from another place, I get modify permissions from another place, add them all together and I end up with modify. However, when NTFS and share permissions are put together, the most restrictive applies. So in other words, if I got full control for my NTFS permissions and only read for my share permissions, what do I end up with? As I scratch my head trying to figure out, gosh, why doesn't Tom have access? I gave him full control. Well, because the share permissions limited were limited to read only. And we'll see how this works here uh, in a demo. Well, planned networks probably don't need share permissions, cause undue complexity. Yeah, a lot of places don't even worry about share permissions. They say, okay, all authenticated users or everybody or something like this have full control, and then I'll uh, restrict it based upon NTFS permissions. That way it handles both across the network access as well as logging in locally access. All right, let's take, care of a, took, uh, take a look at a couple of things here. Uh, file share using server manager file and storage services. This is a different way than what we looked at before. Uh, that is undo, not undo complexity. <laughs> yes, George, thank you. It does, compl uh, it does make things a bit more complex when you have to combine the two. And we'll, like I said, we'll take a look at a couple of things here. All right, let's switch over to the server and have some fun. All right, I'm going to bring up the server manager to do some playing with at this point. Here's my local server. I'm hoping you've seen this a little bit before. Uh, I am I'm just on a work group. I don't have this integrated with uh, directory services, so it's a bit limited as far as uh, in, in the complexity. It just makes it a lot easier for, for simpler demos here. Now, I do have the file and storage services uh, role installed. And I'm going to go down to my shares. And what shares do I have? All right, I have the office share still there. Great, that's, uh, that's fine. That's exactly what I would like at this, at this point. Now, what I'm going to do now is very similar to what we did with Windows Explorer. This is just a slightly different way of doing things. I'll come up here to task. And I'll select new share. Now here's where I have some fun. I have SMB, quick, advanced for applications. I can also set up NFS shares as well. Let's walk through doing a quick file share. I'll hit next. I have a couple of options in here. I can select an entire volume if I wanted to. Yuck, I don't want to do that. I want to be a little more granular. And I'll browse, I'll go to data, and hmm, let's see, let's do finance. That was one of the ones that I wanted to have a, have a bit of a, a play with. I'll select a folder, and there it is e colon backslash data backslash finance. I'll hit next, and boy, that's just really annoying me. It should have been uppercase. I can put in a couple of uh, uh, descriptions in here. Uh, just a quick there we are. So there's my local path. There's my UNC, my universal naming convention, whack whack server name, whack share name. I'll hit next. Next, rather. Uh, I'm sorry, Drew. Uh, yes, we'll be coming back to the advanced uh, SMB shares. I'm just doing this one here real quick. I want to walk through a couple of them here. All right, um, I want to do a customization. Oh, one of the things I could also do is there's, my, there's one place where I could put my enable access-based enumeration. Remember, if a person doesn't have at least some permissions, like read permissions or something like this, they can't even see the share. So that's why uh, this kind of nice that Windows, whole, uh, Windows uh, hides this. I'll hit next. Now I'm going to customize this and add a security principle. And remember, from the very beginning, we had a group out there called Finance. Tom and, was it Tom and Mary or Tom and Sally were members of that? And since they, they are actually uh, uh, 
part of the finance group at the finance folder, I'll give them full permissions. Right? Uh, one of the things I will do also is disable my inheritance. And I'll click on OK because we know what we're doing. Well, at least we're hoping so. Let next. I can review the information here. And I'll hit create. Uh oh. What happened? As I scratch my head? Hmm. Well, that's one of our challenges sometimes when we're doing some of these things and we're not a bit careful. Now, I'm going to go back to my finance one and I'm going to redo this. But this time, and I'm still going to change that uppercase letter F. I'm going to customize the permissions. I have those folks added. What happens? If I do this. Now, what's going to happen? More importantly, is it going to work? Yay! Yeah, exactly. I removed the inheritance, and as the administrator, part of the administrative group, I even got blocked out of it. So I've got to be a little bit careful when I do that. The nice thing is, at least it gives you great big red things here. You can recover from it. It's not that bad. All right, so now, there's my finance share. There's my office share as well, too. I can right-click on it, come on down to Properties. This is a new one as well, too, for those of you that haven't seen it. I can take a look at permissions here. I can take a look at some settings. And any kind of management properties as well, too. So in this case, this is for group files, which most of my nevels are, are going to be uh, uh, centered around that. Uh, does the encryption option for creating shares add a performance overhead on connections or disk utilization? Absolutely. Good question. Yeah, it sure does. And anytime you do any kind of encryption, your um, CPU is going to get hit, of course. And the disk access, I'm not sure how much disk access is going to be hit, but it will be hit. But I know the CPU can get hit a little bit hard on, on, uh, on that. If it's depending upon what type of a production server you have, I mean, the, the standard ones that I used to buy a couple years ago were Dell 710s with uh, dual, uh, dual Xeon with six cores each. Uh, there was never, any, there was really no real, uh, real problem. Even big, a bigger hit on a virtual server, yeah, you're still looking at sharing the CPU uh, on the host system anyway, whether it's one or two cores, whatever you happen to assign to that virtual server. So, yeah, it is going to uh, uh, take a hit there. Now, the whole idea there, of course, is to make sure you just have enough uh, resources. Never use on a SQL server? I, I didn't say that. It's just something you have to be aware of and you have to plan on when you put your server in. Give me enough money. I'll buy you a server where you probably won't notice it. All right, let's see. Let's do something a little bit different here. Uh, let's create another share. Because, if I remember correctly, Drew was mentioning uh, he wanted to see some other file share profiles. Let's do advanced, because this has some neat things in it, too. And I'll go to data and... Ah, oh, geez. You know what? I want a folder in here, but it wasn't created yet. I'm going to create a HR for human resources. We have to be nice to those guys, folks, excuse me, I should say, because they're the ones that uh, hire and fire. So we have to be stay in their good grace. So there's my share name, HR or human resources or whatever it is. I'll just leave it as HR right now. There's my UNC, path to local uh, share, etc. Hit next. I'm just going to leave it, ah, I'll go put in access-based enumeration anyway. Now, under customized, um, the customized side of things here, let's see, I'll do that. 
I am going to add administrators, assuming I can spell correctly. That's why I always like to go through that check uh, check the username because it uh, makes sure that I actually do uh, have it there. All right, so now I've got administrators. Yay. Now at least I shouldn't, in theory, block myself out. Hit OK. Hit Next. This is going to be for groups of users or, uh, for, for accessing and mucking around with the data. I'm not going to do any quotas. I'll cover quotas a little bit later on. I like the concept of quotas, and my users hate me for it. It all looks good. And create, and we're all right. Now, the big difference there was a couple of extra prompts, but not a huge difference there, I don't think, between the quick and the uh, the more uh, advanced one there. Well, that's great. I've just created a couple of shares. I've got a finance share. I've got a HR share. I've got an office share there as well, too. So I'm well on my way to creating my file structure as well as my security infrastructure. But something I really would like to do as I'm going through, before I get too far down the possibly the wrong path, is I'd like to check some of these permissions to see what are, what are actually uh, taking effect. Ah, one thing that I want to do is a quick review, though. I'm going to bring up my uh, uh, local users here. I have Mary, Sally, Ted, and Tom. My, we were playing with finance, so Sally and Tom are our two finance people. So let's keep that in mind. So let's take a look at security. Got a question mark, there we are. So finance has full control. So Peter and Sally should have full control. Well, let's check that because computers lie to me all the time. And I hate them for that. Oops, excuse me. Effective access is what effective access is what we're looking for. I'm going to select the user and I'll select Tom. And since finance has full Control Tom therefore gets, gee, I hope he gets full control. That's what I gave him. We'll just verify that. Oh, gosh. Something happened. Hmm. Any ideas? Any ideas what happened there? I obviously screwed something up. What could it be? Here we are, there's the slide. Share conflict with permissions, absolutely. Spot on, Peter, thank you. Let's check that. Sharing, advanced sharing. I have it saved as finance, that's correct. Permissions, oh, wait a minute. Everyone by default only got read permissions. So, going back to that slide that we just brought up, if I combine my NTFS permissions, which I had for full, and I combine my share permissions, which is read, I go with the most restrictive, and that's why Tom effect effectively only got read permissions. So let's change that, and we'll give everyone, oh, I hate that, but I'll just demonstrate this. Uh, we'll do this for everyone. Now, let's take a look at Tom once more. Oh, yay, I did it right this time, hot dog. Well, in theory, Sally should be able to access it too because she's part of finance. Yay. And let's see, um, Ted was the other one, wasn't it? Ooh, Ted didn't get any permissions. Oh, wait. He's not part of the finance group. We don't trust Ted, therefore he's out. 
as an example. Of course, we trust it, just not, we just doesn't need to have access, let's say, uh, to the finance section. Now, I can also do this. It says select a user, but I tried putting in finance. Hmm. Doesn't quite like that one there. Who's the other one there? Ted, Sally, uh, Mary is my other user that we can take a look at. And she shouldn't have access again because she, hasn't, uh, she doesn't uh, belong to finance. So that's how I can, one way that I can go ahead and check on whether or not I actually set my file permissions correctly. So what's the general rule of avoiding conflicts between share security and file folder security? Uh, it's kind of, well, you'll see a lot of folks out there who will grant, they'll create the share. Once they create the share, like so, As an example, this, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. But at the share level, grant for full permissions, and then use NTFS permissions to get the granularity that you need. That way you just have to worry about NTFS permissions, whether or not they log, log in locally or if they log in across the network. Let's see, let's take a look at, let's see, that was finance. Oh yeah, HR. HR was the other one that I created, wasn't it? Security. Uh, let's edit that one. I'm going to add, uh, let's see, Mary, Sally. Let's add Mary to, to a HR. Was it Ted was the other one? Yeah, I'll add Ted as well, too. Ted can be part of HR. And I want to make sure that Mary gets full control, Ted gets full control. Okay, we know what we're doing, and life's good. And now, of course, when we come back in again, looks like we have the same problem once more. Yep, yeah, it's only read permissions there. Now, one thing I've noticed is that once I make these changes and I click on OK and apply and all that other fun stuff, sometimes when I come into here and take, take a look at effective access, I still get all these little red X's. I found that if I close this and then come back in again, It actually gives me uh, the, 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 what I'm what I'm expecting at least. So just kind of a, a little little uh, feature there that uh, you may you may run into some challenges or something like that if you're in a hurry or you're just kind of scratching your head of why is this happening. Just get out of it, come back into it. Life's all good. All right. Is uh, is there a security risk and less restrictive share permissions and more restrictive file folder permissions? Not that I'm aware of. No. Uh, you may just want to go with change permissions as an example. I, I know there's a lot of places that don't want to give full permissions, they'll just do change on the share and then they'll use the uh, NTFS permissions. Uh, that seems to be pretty much the standard. I, I'm trying to think of a place that I've worked at that has used both share and NTFS permissions as far as kind of find, I'm trying to manipulate both of them and I can't think of one off the top of my head. Does anybody use a combination of NTFS and share permissions and uh, oil and gas sector does that? Fair enough. Interesting that they, uh, they're actually uh, playing with the uh, share permissions because uh, you can do most, in fact, you can do everything you need to out of the NTFS. All right. Let's see, I think. Oops, let's see, we created the, uh, oh, come on, sorry getting you dizzy going scrolling through and forth back and forth. Create file share using server manager, file uh, uh, storage services, we did that. Assign basic NTFS permissions to share folder, we did that. We also did effective permissions and some of the gotchas that you might uh, uh, see there. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 George, yep, no combination, share full and NTFS only up to modify, yeah. 
that's actually real common as well too. Um, NTFS modify very seldom you give full control to a to a group of users outside the administrators. Okay, another fun one: volume shadow copies. Love the concept. I've seen it screw things up because people aren't really using this the way it was intended to be used. So let me go into a bit of an explanation here on our volume shadow copies. The idea here is that I'll have users accessing a file system, file folders and so on. They're making changes to the files, they're saving them, they're making changes to the files, uh, etc. Every so often, let's say at 7 a.m. Uh, at uh, on Monday through Friday, I have a shadow copy made of that uh, that all the files at that point in time. Well, three or four days later, someone comes along and says, "Oh gosh, you know, I've just thoroughly screwed up this file." I need the one that I had a couple of days ago. Could you please go to the tape library and restore it for me? Well, no, <laughs> or yes, I can. I better be doing my backups. Uh, no, I really don't want to do this. So it's nice if the user would have the capability of being able to recover a file from a certain point in time. When you turn on shadow copies, however, it is a volume-based turn-on, turn-off type of thing, not file or folder-based. So that's kind of a, a, a gotcha. So when you turn it on to on a volume, if it's a 10 terabyte volume, by gosh, that entire 10 terabytes is going to have a volume uh, shadow copies uh, assigned to it. Now, whether or not you actually set them up on, on the files and folders, that's, a, that's different. But enabling it is at the volume level. So let's take a look at using Windows Explorer and configuring shadow copies for a, a volume. And I'm sorry, George, um, with shadow copies, hang on a second. I will get there shortly. Now, this is one way to do it. I'll go ahead and right-click on my volume. Now, obviously, I, I'm not touching my... I just have this fundamental issue about touching my C drive for anything outside of the operating system. Uh, storage of data uh, in user files, etc. I kind of pathologically avoid uh, putting it out there. So I'll come on down here to properties, shadow copy, and right now my shadow copy is disabled. Note that I do have four shares out there, which should match with what I have. I'll go ahead and enable that. If you enable shadow copies, window will use a default schedule and settings and create a shadow copy of the selected volumes now. Now also note, not appropriate for servers that have I.O. load. So you should manually configure the shadow copies and place the storage area on a, separate, on a volume that, uh, that will not be shadow copied. Some interesting things in there. So I'll still do this. And let's take a look at the settings. Now well, my storage area is drive E, mainly because I don't have, really have another drive that I can put this on. I think drive E is something like, uh, what was it, uh, I think it's 5 meg, or 5 gig rather, oh 25 gig, sorry, it's a 25 gig volume. Of that 25 gig, I'm going to use about 2.5 gig for shadow copies. My schedule is the default in this case, and it's going to be 7 a.m. Monday through Friday every week. Now I can also take a look at creating new new ones. I can repeat the task every a certain amount of time. Um, yeah, I've got different uh, different types of options here. But I'm just going to go ahead and accept the default threat at this point. So now it is uh, at 4.04, 4.03 a.m. rather, I have set up a shadow copy for this. Well, that's fine and dandy. Now, the idea here would be that as, hang on a second, let's take a look at this. Um, no, I'm sorry. As I come into HR, rather, and let's say I want to create different types of files. I 
I may have a whole bunch of files listed here, and I go in and I modify them. I can modify this one, I come back to this one, etc. And at 7 a.m. each morning, a snapshot of these files will be taken via shadow copies. The users, when they right-click, unfortunately I don't have this all set up here completely, uh, but, when, but accessing it remotely as an example across a network share, the users could right-click on those files and they could restore a previous version. And the versions would be, uh, would be a sort of, would be a setup here. I wonder, let's try something, whoops, let's try this, just for curiosity. Um, no, all right, didn't, uh, didn't take that one. But the idea here is that I would have different versions here available for me to do a restore. Now, here's the problem that can occur. You have a certain amount of, or a finite number of file versions you can keep by default 64, depending upon disk space that's allocated for file your shadow copies. There are some people that try to use this capability as a versioning control mechanism for their files. So in other words, they'll create a version and say, okay, well, that's my first version as a draft. Then they'll create a second version. Then they'll create a third version. And this is how they do versioning control for documents. Well, that's not what this is for. If you want to do versioning control and so on, take a look at SharePoint. Absolutely wonderful product. And that's what it's meant for, putting documents up there, version control, change control, also, uh, flow control, all sorts of things that you can put into SharePoint. But volume shadow copy is not for that purpose. So that's something I'd really like to, to, uh, uh, to emphasize here. All right, so that's, uh, that's what we're looking at on our volume shadow copies. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and disable that now. I'm back to where I was. All right, now, the other thing that I absolutely love, uh, whoops, hang on a second, I'm sorry. Um, how do you look up volume shadow copies to remove or add? Uh, that was from the right-clicking on the files as an example is a good way to uh, take a look at which versions that you may want to restore. Uh, is there a good method for calculating the amount of space on a volume used for shadow copies, as in planning purposes? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a tool that can be used for this, and I just don't know off the top of my head. I, don't, I think the defaults are a little bit low if your users are doing a lot of changes and if they have a lot of files that they're using. Um, but as far as a formula or something like that, I don't know of one off the top of my head. It's a good question. I'll have to see if I can, I'll write that down and I'll see if I can remember that one. See if I can find some information on that. All right, Windows permission architecture. Uh, percentage over time, there, there may be, Peter. Uh, I just don't know off the top of my head what that would be. I'd, I'd have to do a, a quick, uh, not Google, I'd, this is a Microsoft class, so it would be a Bing search on that. NTFS quotas, as I mentioned before, I absolutely love the concept of this. Because one of the problems I always seem to have is my users think that they dump things on the server, and how much disk space does my server have? An infinite amount. It's a black hole for data that just gets sucked in and there's no way that I could ever fill it up as a user. And of course, the administrators are going, oh my gosh, look at all the videos this person is storing. They've got things dating back 15 years all on DVD and they're trying to store it on our SQL server or, 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 or something like this. Well, hopefully not a SQL server, but on some sort of inappropriate platform that was never designed for mass storage of files. So an option here is to set quota limits for particular volumes. Now we can set what's referred to as a soft quota 
or a hard quota. The soft quota is kind of being nice. It's kind of like the, 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 the touchy-feely, fluffy type of thing saying, well, you know, you've, you've kind of got, gone over your, your limit. Would you mind deleting some of your files because, well, it'd be the polite thing to do. Or the hard quota is, you know what, this is the limit. We'll, loan, we'll, uh, we'll let you know what about the 85% level. We'll even send you an email that you're getting pretty critically close. But if you go over this level, you can't add or change, most likely, any files until you delete some. So it's really, really enforced. So it kind of depends on how you want to enforce this, I suppose, and what kind of, administra uh, what kind of administrator your, uh, uh, what kind of administrative environment, I suppose, that you have. Now, the way that this is measured is by the size, obviously, as well as uh, what files the users actually own. So it's user ownership. And again, it is set at the volume level. Now, there is another way of doing this, and I don't have this installed, actually, the FSRM, the File Server Resource Manager. This allows things such as email notifications to go out to the users. I think that's a great way to do it. Pop them an email. They say, you know what? You're getting close to your limit. Instead of just not warning them and say, well, gee, you've just reached the limit. I'm not letting you to do anything. It's not very nice to do that to your users. Uh, execute commands with the FSRM as well as generate different reports. I like that one because you can get reports on things such as uh, file size, duplicate files, uh, you can take a look at types of files. Uh, you can, in, in, uh, we can also put in with the, our, our uh, file server uh, uh, role here, we can also put in what's referred to as uh, essentially masks. So you're not allowed to upload different types of content to certain directories. For example, I don't want people adding MP4 files or MOV files or WMV files to these directories because it's not supposed to be a media server. I want to keep them out, thus saving a lot of uh, our disk space. So let's take a look at uh, some NTFS uh, quota sharing on the hard and soft quotas, and we can at least take a look at some of the quotas here on, on, on some of the various options. Let's see, maybe I do have SRM, SRM installed. There it is. I do have it installed. Yay. Okay. So, here's my quotas. Front row. I don't have any. Well, you know what? This is a great opportunity to create some. So, we'll click on Create Quotas. And what's my path? Oh, let's see, Office Share. You know, the, the thing is here, this is an Office Share. It's open to everybody in my office. I don't want them just to dump their entire C drive or D drive or E drive or something like that in there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some quotas here. Well, gosh, how, what kind of, uh, what kind of limit do I want to take a look at? 200 gig volume usage, monitor 500. Let's do that one. And let's take a look at some of my defaults here. Well, it's a soft type of enforcement. I'll get a warning via an email at 80%, another warning when I've reached the limit, and another warning at 120. Wait a minute, I just went over 100%. Oh, it's because it's a soft quota. It's not really enforcing. It's just saying, you're kind of waving a hand, holding a hand up saying, hey, you know what? There, uh, there's an issue here. You might want to consider as an example, uh, reducing the amount of content that you have in those subdirectories. Here's another option, auto-apply template and create quotas on existing and new subfolders. Hmm. I can also do some along the same type of things in here, but note now that it is a hard enforcement. 85% email, 95% email and event log, and 100%. Now, here's a bit of the challenge that we have. If you create, let's say, a hard quota, 
and let's say it's a fairly low one, maybe 100 megabytes, and some user comes along and has uh, 120 megabytes that they're copying over. And it's dutifully copying everything over, and all of a sudden it hits in the middle of a file, it hits that 100 megabit limit. Well, you could have some really upset users. So you have to make sure that this quota is large enough if they need to do some sort of a, a sharing of content, but of course small enough to make it manageable. Another thing you could also consider, uh, a little bit beyond what we're, gonna, what we're covering today though, is what's referred to as file screens. And as I mentioned before, file screens for blocking audio and video files, executables, images, to certain subdirectories. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful tool. And you can see that in Server 2008 as well too. All right, now, let me take a look. Um, I can edit my quota properties because perhaps I just don't like those. And instead of 500 meg, I'll just take this as a one gig. I'm gonna make this a hard quota instead. Obviously, I don't need my 120 because it's a hard quota at this point. And I'll hit OK. So again, I can go ahead and modify this you know, on the fly uh, as I go through. And I can even disable my quotas also. Note the little downward pointing uh, button here that we can uh, that we can also play with. Uh, let's see, I'll enable my quotas once more. View my quotas that are affecting things out here. And I can see the, let's run that up a little bit so we can actually see the details here. There we go. Uh, I'm sorry, um, difference between the drive properties templates. Ah, here we have the uh, built-in templates themselves, so we can use these templates as a base piece in order to create new quotas. So drive properties, for example, here's a listing of these quotas, and you'll see those listed right here my templates. So what I could do is I could go ahead and create a new template, save it, and then when I create a new, a new quota up here, I could use that derived, uh, that new template that I've created. Um, see, hard quotas challenging too if the user decides to restructure the folder structure by moving files. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that... Uh, there's all sorts of things you can run into with quotas, and it usually bites you in the rear end at times. I shouldn't say that, but it does come along and, and, and get you a little bit later on. If you didn't um, think of something, and let's face it, we can't think of everything. It's just going to come along and, and, uh, and uh, catch us unawares at times. All right. Another one, by the way, just as an aside, I love this file server uh, resource manager. Um, uh, if I can avoid it, I'd rather not use quotas. I prefer try to give my users at least as much uh, as much rope as possible. You know, obviously not enough to, uh, enough to uh, hurt themselves with it, but I like to give my users as much storage sp space as they, as they think they need. But to keep things kind of in check, you can create you can use the uh, you can uh, create these uh, storage reports. So you can get Take a look at things like duplicate files, file screenings, audits, files by owners. Uh, you can get it in different types of report formats. Quota usage. You can have, uh, oops, um, there we are. You can take a look at uh, where these things should be, group, and file, uh, group files and user files. How do you want them delivered? Email to you as an example. I don't have an SMTP server set up here, so that's not gonna work. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then when do you want them sent out? Daily, weekly, every so uh, every few hours, and so on. Absolutely love that capability. It's been around for a little while, uh, while though. Um, oh, come on, Andrew. <laughs> yes, okay, it is a little fan fancy one, but let's come on. Yeah, George, uh, I don't like that person. That's, uh, yeah, they do something like that. So you'll, you, if, uh, for those of you who've been uh, playing with Windows Server 2008, probably no real new things here. Uh, it's just uh, 
Yeah, it's uh, the, the quota management, the file screening management has been around for you know, 2008, 2008, or 2008, or two. The reporting capabilities has been there for a while. All of the NTFS things that we've been doing have been around for years and years and years. It's just how you can do them now. A few uh, newer interfaces, a few newer uh, tools to do this with. Uh, again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, pick, your, pick, the you know, have, pick the way that you want to do it the way that you're comfortable with doing it. Um, I'm still a huge fan of going to Windows Explorer. I feel it's a little bit more granular. I can see what's going on a little bit more, but uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing it from file and storage services. All right, I believe, yep, that does bring us to the end of this session. The answer to your chat uh, questions be documented. Uh, actually, I think I answered all of them with the exception of one. And I'll have to scroll up here to get to that one. And yeah, I'll have to scroll. I did. Uh, there was one that I do have to look up. So yes, that one I can po post onto the portal. Oh, transcribed. Um, yeah, just might be able to do that. I think that, yeah, this does get saved as a file. I haven't thought of doing that, Peter, but uh, yeah, it's a good, uh, a good question. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that. All right, other questions, comments, etc. please. It's kind of an open thing. We still have about, oh, a whole nine minutes. I timed that one fairly well. There's quite a few of you out there, so. Oh, glad, glad uh, you enjoyed it, Peter. Thank you. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. The uh, I think this. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the scheduling of these this uh, this course is supposed to be. I know we've got an exchange 20, 2013. I think it is. I'll be writing, and um, they've got a good security course coming up uh, later on this year. I think so. Should be good. Oh, how do you get the window uh, chat windows up? <laughs> I have no idea on your end. I really don't. Uh, let's see. Actually, I don't even have it open. All right. All right, I just uh, sent out a, uh, okay, Andrew, you couldn't find it either? All right. Oh, a Mac user we have in our midst. Love that operating system. Absolutely love it. Uh, transfer users can comments for the recent as always. Uh, great session. Great. Okay. Super. All right. I'll have to. Uh, um, I guess I'll turn off the recording at this point. That way, if someone has some something to say, uh, we can do that. Although I probably w still probably wouldn't put it in the chat window. I think that's still being uh, 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 recorded. Uh, can WSL 12 serve HTTP? Uh, Peter, yes. Depending upon what you're trying to do with it. Uh, Server 2012 does come in a couple of uh, different flavors. You can use the um, uh, install the web services role, of course, and be able to be able to access different files and folders that way. Create your virtual folders uh, on um, on the volumes, and you pretty much access everything that way. The other option, of course, is use SharePoint, all HTTP based as well too. I think it's certain portions of SharePoint. I think are still free. I have to double check. I haven't I haven't installed SharePoint for a few years now. Uh, you're in, uh, seem to be in some sort of limited mode. Really? Hmm. I'm not sure what that would be. I'll have to check with the the powers that be to see if there's a, uh, what the differences here are. Oh, Peter, stop passing around rumors. All right, jeez. <laughs> All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point. Thank you very, very much. I greatly appreciate the, uh, the questions, etc. And, uh, yeah, I'll get this posted, I'm hoping, uh, within uh, probably, well, this afternoon my time, which should probably be late, late night, early morning your time.